Good afternoon and welcome to Match of the Day for a thrilling South West London derby between Fulham and Chelsea. Canaville, speedy! A tussle for First Division survival between Luton and Norwich. Good save! And another of those mini features supporting the lower divisions which you seem to enjoy. This time it's Torquay. And we end with the result of a rather special Goal of the Month competition. Today's headlines concern the latest on England's bid to stage the 1986 World Cup Finals, the return of Manchester United's Brian Robson after injury, the possibility that Celtic's Charlie Nicholas could soon be on the move, and the reason for George Best's non-appearance for Bournemouth. Well, where else shall we be on boat race day but beside the Thames? And Fulham's successful season, putting him in line for promotion to Division 1, gave us the perfect opportunity especially as their opponents and neighbours, Chelsea, have suddenly found themselves in urgent need of points too, for a less spectacular but equally important reason. It all it added up to a thrilling match overlooking the river, your commentator, John Motson. On the day of the boat race, the tranquility of the Thames contrasts sharply with the partisan feeling inside Craven Cottage, where there is a segregated all-ticket crowd. Those Chelsea supporters are at the Putney end, knowing their club still need points to avoid relegation to the third division for the first time ever. But for the Fulham fans at the Hammersmith end, it looks like a return to the first division for the first time since 1968. Malcolm McDonald joined the club as a player that year, and today as manager announces an unchanged team. He sets all his players' personal scoring targets. Number 11, Ray Lewington, an old Chelsea player, incidentally, reached his back in October. But number 9, Dean Coney, and number 10, Ray Houghton, are both looking for their first league goal since October. For Chelsea, Bob Isles replaces Steve Francis in goal. Joey Jones and Mickey Droy return after suspension and injury, respectively. And Mike Fillory is also back, although he's available for transfer. And he, above all, may have missed the influence of Tony McAndrew, who's been out for five months. So these two old West London rivals facing each other in a match vital to both teams. Chelsea in blue, Fulham in the white shirts. And Chelsea playing from the left in the first half. Here's Colin Pates with the header. Robert Wilson for Fulham. He scored two last week against Grimsby. And the Chelsea back four this afternoon has got two giants in the middle. Colin Lee is playing alongside Mickey Droy. The pitch showing just how sticky it's bound to get. Lewington. Well played, and Joey Jones rescued Chelsea and Bob Isles. A very good cross from a tight angle by Ray Lewington. And Droy was there. Oh, Driscoll! A fine effort by Sean O'Driscoll, taken first time as Fulham mount the first sustained attacking of the match. Speedy. Brown not too sure the first time. Awkward day perhaps for defenders when they're forced to turn quickly. And Coney is penalised for fouling Lee. Jones was well forward there for Chelsea. Houghton. Lock. It was Lee's header. Fillory got it away from O'Driscoll. An important challenge to win. Canneville. And Fillory. That was brilliantly done by him, and it deserved a goal. Because he won the 50-50 ball in midfield and fed Canneville. And it was Fillory who made up the ground and went for the return. It was a fine example of how a midfield player 
can get involved twice in a move. Bumstead. Rose Brown, who forced the corner. And Joey Jones making himself a nuisance on the near post. Mickey Droy will come in from deeper. Bumstead to take the corner. And Droy got up. Canaville. Well taken. Chelsea lead 1-0. And Paul Canaville scores. The corner swung across by Bumstead. Troy and Lee jumping together. The ball fell for Canaville. A good volley into the far side of the net. And Canaville, who scored his first league goals in the 4-2 win over Carlisle three weeks ago, puts Chelsea in front at the home of their local rivals. And the Chelsea fans behind the goal into which Canaville struck that shot absolutely delighted and that'll be sweet music too to his ears to hear them respond that set the match up very nicely if you're a neutral things have been going so well for Fulham this season and so badly for Chelsea that to see the underdogs on this occasion score first gives promise of things to come forward got his shot in and a corner the deflection took the ball out so Chelsea took the lead from a corner Fulham will be looking to equalize in similar fashion three of the back four are up there So is Davis. It was away from him by the goalkeeper O'Driscoll to Lewington. And the heavy men are still forward. O'Driscoll. And Houghton who miskicked. It's still not away. Gale. O'Driscoll into Davis, who was fouled on the edge of the area. Colin Lee spoken to by the referee for protesting about the decision. He didn't feel it was a foul, Lee, but it's given Fulham a chance to conjure something from about 20 yards, and the lecture fairly pointed to Colin Lee. Lock curled it. Simple enough. And Fulham, who went behind from a corner, equalised from a free kick. Chelsea will contest the award in the first place. But Kevin Lock, who scored here when Chelsea last played in the league at Craven Cottage three years ago, it was a penalty then, curls the free kick in with his celebrated left foot. So it's 1-1. And what a start to this local derby. Hopkins forward. That's Droy. Driscoll caught by Rhodes Brown. My first one, he's saying, but others have offended prior to him, and sometimes 
the cumulative effect of fouls is that the last in the line gets booked and that's what's going to happen to Peter Rhodes Brown Troy Wilson Canneville Fillery stepped across him, that's obstruction, an indirect free kick inside the area. Bates is standing just behind Fillery to the left. He might fancy a crack with his left foot. Pates, and the wall does its job. Turned back by Lee. Lock. Looking for Davis. Jones in the way. Lewington. Oh, well played by Gordon Davis, but Chelsea were back in numbers. speedy the pitch is playing a big part in the way players are getting penalized simply because the man in possession would normally have moved the ball on on a better top but it's sticking a bit the ball and therefore the feet are there longer than they would normally be Lee to take the free kick Droy is up for this, it came off Brown. Canneville, speedy! What a good save by Jerry Payton. It was very much like the Chelsea goal. The ball bobbling around in the area, speedy got the shot in this time. Payton responded well, corner. To be taken by Canneville. Mickey Droy off the top of the crossbar. Mickey Droy back today in the Chelsea side after missing eight matches since his injury in the FA Cup tie at Derby. It's his testimonial year and he's an influence that Chelsea badly need in their present position. and it comes off Hutchings for the corner in the last minute of the first half Fulham have not had anything like the share of the play they would expect in a normal home match but Gale and Brown are forward to challenge for Locke's corner flicked off Fillery, O'Driscoll is coming in Fillery, a lovely ball down the line to Rhodes Brown. Now, can he take on Lewington? Again, the pitch not helping the player with possession. Denying him the run of the ball that he wanted. And Fulham instead had an opportunity. Tremendous tackle by Mickey Droy. Hutchings forward. 
Pates. Rhodes Brown onside. And off Speedy and off Gale. And if you like your football laced with blood and thunder, that was a cracking first half. So typical of a rumbustious local derby. Chelsea took the lead, Fulham equalised, both from set plays, but the spirit of the half embodied by Mike Fillery, who was involved in all Chelsea's good work. John Neal must have been pleased with the way his Chelsea side performed in the first half. You've got to know your West London football to understand quite what's at stake here. So much pride involved down the years, depending which end of the Fulham Road your lord is lie. Chelsea, winners of a European trophy in 1971, but 12 years later, having a thin time of it. And Fulham, it would seem, about to go back where their supporters feel they belong. But in the first half, Chelsea had more of the game. Lewington forward. Houghton. Lewington now looks for Wilson. Touched off by Coney to Wilson. Well played. And well saved too by Bavales. From Robert Wilson. Nicely laid off too by Dean Coney. A centre forward, not unlike Malcolm McDonald in build, and he certainly learned from him. forward Coney contesting it and Lee staying firm having a good match at the back with Droy here's Hutchings Canneville he got his cross in and Bumstead's arriving and Speedy and Fillery three of them in there and none of them could put it away and still Chelsea press with Pates. <laughs> Davis pulled up. Well, Chelsea saw a chance go begging then. But now they have the free kick. Lee takes. And Droy. Davis, by his standards, a quiet match so far, but he's always dangerous. Like that. 18 goals so far this season, Gordon Davis. Canneville. Oh, he took them on beautifully there. Canneville shot. Side netting. But when this lad gets the ball on his left foot, he shows what a developing player he is. It took him a while to adjust, obviously, when he came into league football from Hillingdon. But there have been glimpses of skill today and confidence which augur well for his future and Chelsea's. Wilson. Davis Graves Brown for Chelsea That's a foul by Hutchings on Hopkins One has to say on behalf of both teams that there's been no complaint at all about the number of tackles that have crashed in this afternoon no retaliation it first time 
again the pitch the winner Davis Speedy and Lewington and Fillery Chelsea can come wide with Rhodes Brown and Cannaville is onside and well played by Jerry Payton a telling ball by Peter Rhodes Brown Droy relishes that sort of challenge Wilson and Houghton on to lock it'll go again to Houghton Davis and lock linking up again with the attack appealing for handball against Joey Jones here's Gale Brown only as far as Roger Brown Davis and Houghton Houghton shot and well gathered by Bob Isles on this sort of surface particularly in that muddy six yard area anything's possible if it gets a bad bounce clung on well there there are 10 minutes to go it's still 1-1 Fillery for Chelsea Cannaville Jones getting the ball off Davis and putting Speedy away Fillery's making strides into the centre to support Cannaville he's checked now and come short Fillery now he needs help and Cannaville good save well when you see Fillery play like this you feel he should be in the first division and pride is preserved in West London because the match ends in a draw Fulham may prefer to look back on this in the end as a point gained rather than two drops. There are bound to be difficult games when you're near to promotion. And Paul Cannaville's goal put Chelsea in front. Fulham's equaliser came from Kevin Locke. And the message from the match, as I'm sure John Neal, the Chelsea manager on the left of our picture, might reflect, is that in holding Malcolm McDonald's team here, his club have proved that in spite of all the tribulations Chelsea have been through, they're a long way from being dead and buried yet. They battled really well, have had an appetite for the match in the occasion, and it was a good spectacle, played in a fine spirit, and it ended in a 1-1 draw. And I wish the boat race, which we all saw afterwards from the towpath, had been as close. But both teams deserve credit for the way in which they played the game under trying conditions. But I'm assured next season, Fulham's new cellular pitch will be the envy of all. And one or two envious sides were on the performance of Chelsea's young Paul Cannaville, signed from Hillingdon Borough a couple of years ago. And this excellent low camera angle testifies to his ability and perfectly demonstrates how to volley and keep the ball down. There he is, number 11. It also reveals that it was Roger Brown who flicked the ball on, not a Chelsea player. It dropped rather fortunately in exactly the right place for Cannonville, but he takes over from then on, shapes himself up beautifully and gets above that ball to make sure it remains the same height. And no wonder he's excited there and he excited a few people there yesterday afternoon. Well now for our second game and it's the relegation battle between two of the teams promoted last season, Luton and Norwich. And in my view, both have enough going for them to stay in Division 1 given a fair win, that is. Well, let's see which way it blew yesterday. Your commentator is Barry Davis. Kept him out of the England squad, and so takes his place in a Luton Town lineup, which once again is looking for their first home victory since Boxing Day. Two new names from the last time we saw them. In goal, Tony Godden, who is on loan from West Bromwich Albion, and at number eight, Trevor Aylott, signed from Millwall. And one tactical change, we'll see Mal Donaghy moved into midfield with Mitchell Thomas getting another chance at left back. 
Norwich City have had three draws since going out of the FA Cup at Brighton and have been able to welcome back two experienced players, Martin O'Neill, recovered from a fractured elbow, and at number 11, Mick Shannon. For one late change in their lineup before this match, Dave Bennett in for Mark Barham, who has a toe injury. David Fleet likes to sit down on the bench, but Ken Brown believes in starting the match at least up in the director's box. So Norwich to start the game. And both teams in their critical positions, looking for the sort of form of which they ended last season. Luton Town going away to win the second division championship by eight points. And uh, Norwich City winning ten matches out of eleven. The referee this afternoon is Mike James of Horsham. He's given the first free kick to Norwich City. And the first test forgotten. And he's thoroughly equal to it. Pleasant sunshine, but it's a cold afternoon, and what wind there is is blowing left to right. It's Greg Downs for Norwich. Slightly got underneath that. Downs. Virgin running right to left. Goodyear. Hill. Horton. Aylott. Useful purchase by David Fleet, Trevor Aylott. It's Paul Walsh. Plenty of people in the middle. Aylott, Hill. But it's easy to say it was uh, hit in the end. But a longer cross at one stage, a little earlier than when it was in fact made, would have found Moss unmarked on the far post. running on with Warford. Walsh. Good turn. Not a bad try. A little turn. Give himself a little bit of space. Virgin and Elliott, Mendham, gets through two, Donaghy just got a foot in, Mendham, Thomas across, times the challenge well, Norwich City corner, Mendham got through a couple of tackles then, and he found himself with a bit of room on the right until Thomas got a right foot in the way. Rashow in the six-yard box. Jordan got the fist to it. Goodyear out. Downs. He thought about one, didn't he? Well, the angle was poor. Goodyear tries to get the jump. And the bounce a bit kind. To Luton Town. He's still got an injured player in the area is Ricky Shannon. He's holding both the back of his head and his mouth. Shadow into Sun. Not away yet. Birchin. Downs. Finally has the shot that he might have had some several seconds earlier. A long clearance by Gordon. Walford. Elliott. Stevens. Goodyear. Hill. Stevens. Looking for Wall. 
Walsh. Wood says it is. It's his, and it was for a moment. And is now completely. Thomas. Throw given the other way. I believe for pinching too much ground. Paul Haylock. Gannon. Watson has come forward, so I can assume there will be a long throw. Dean, Birchin and Bennett on the edge of the six-yard area. Shannon. Good save. Very, very good save. He had to get back. The ball was spinning quite a lot. And all credit to Tony Godden, who really used his feet quickly just to get the hand up and turn the ball over the crossbar. Bennett with the corner. Dean comes first. And some push and shove spotted by the linesman. And the free kick has been given. Shannon. Nice head. O'Neill, puts it down this time. Shannon. Nicely chipped up for Bennett. Oh, yes! Really nice goal. And Mickey Shannon, who's had a really good spell in the last five minutes, lays on the goal for Bennett. Nice move down the right side. Good cross indeed. That picked up Bennett, who'd stolen in unwatched. Well, he certainly hit it cleanly enough to give Godden little chance. Donaghy. O'Neill. Started the move, in fact had two bites at the start of it. Here's John Dean. Birchin. Bennett. to corner and the man entitled to smile Ken Brown and on the left is Relook the chairman Arthur S of Norwich City Birchin room for the cross and half hit first by O'Neill the following is by Shannon Mendham across the goal, uh, Bennett rather across the goal, and it's hurt him. And a knock on the ankle as he made the shot. They need all the support they can get at the moment. Virgin coming in with Elliott. And the last action of the half in which Dave Bennett's goal divides the teams. Goal laid on for him by Mickey Shannon, who has showed the sort of determination which has played a considerable part in giving Norwich the lead at half time. Mitchell Thomas has had to have three stitches in an eye wound during the half time interval. And Dave Bennett fit to continue for Norwich City who are now attacking the goal to our right. Here's Mal Donaghy. Stevens. Virgin with the chase. Hill. 
Walsh. A lot. Looking long for Hill. See on the covering man. Then O'Neill. Luton Town have taken just four points out of the last 18. Stevens. A lot. Another good pass to Hill. The struggle to get the ball under control. And in the end, failed to do so. Birchin. Oh! And it hit high up on the crossbar by the line of the far post. Shannon. And Birchin really a fine try that beat Godden to the wide and hit the top edge, it seemed, of the crossbar almost as it joined the far post. Now Stevens. Hill. The Pepper Bills attack. Hill. Donaghy. Oh, that's a bad ball, though. It caught in two minds, surely, as to where he was going to play it. But here's Walsh. Good blocking by Downs. A disappointing ball for Luton in the middle of that attack by Donaghy. Horton really was moving into the space nicely. Stevens with the corner. Driven across and across everybody. Horton. Luton ball. 25 minutes left. Norris leading by one to nothing. But the away side beginning to feel a little bit of pressure on them. Stevens has to make it. Thomas. Walsh. No one by Elot. Good side control too under Extreme Company. Donaghy. That's the sort of ball he wanted a minute ago. Horton. Good try. Well, he played that shot from a very central position. And he was given the sort of ball he wanted a few moments ago when he would have had a better angle, really, for the shot. Dean. Bennett. It's a corner. And Luton Town bringing up Mitchell Thomas, who's had a problem with his eyebrow, really, around his right eye. So Mitchell Thomas off and replaced by Ray Daniel. Well, they've good reason to be happy at the moment, these supporters who've come down from East Anglia. Making their place in a crowd of 11,211. Good support. Norwich supporters come on new yellows. Away by Daniel. Only to Dean. A better effort than it may have looked in the end. Donaghy once more. Oh, he didn't look, Elliot. It would have run much more comfortably. Here's Daniel. It's difficult to get into the game. Horton, Hill. Haylock encouraged to get it away by Woods. Pressure at the finish, not exactly concerted. And the referee holding up play while Ross Jack is brought into the action in place of Mickey Shannon. Done his job well. And 
Jack has got two and a quarter minutes to play. So there is between Norwich and victory. Alot Hill, the challenge by Dean. Stevens, Horton, Goodyear, Moss. Nobody there. Gloves on to prevent a bit of nail biting. Stevens, Alot, Horton, trying to find an opening. Donaghy on Moss. Oh, what a save! Brilliant save by Chris Woods from David Moss. And the equaliser looked to be there for the taking. Somehow he stuck out his left hand and turned the ball away. Stevens, Donaghy, it's Elliot at the back in fact, banged away by Haylock, what a really fine save, he's looked thoroughly confident and confident all afternoon and produced an exceptional save at the end to probably ensure the three points for Norwich City. It's Haylock. Jack, goal kick, he thought it was deflected, he would have had a taste, the goal kick has been given and taken. Good year, time wasted and none left for Luton Town, the one goal by Dave Bennett in the 26th minute has been good enough to give Norwich City three points position saved for them by a really brilliant save right at the death from Chris Woods which denied David Moss the equaliser so the final score leaves the Norwich City supporters jubilant because their team have won by the only goal and the disappointed David Pleat makes his way to the dressing room the manager of a side who still haven't won here since Boxing Day and have been beaten now for the sixth time this season Three rather valuable points there, Mick. Yeah, delighted, Barry, obviously. You know, we're still in trouble. Like, it's just the depth that varies at the moment. But uh, we're looking forward to... We've got a few home games to come, and uh, there's an awful lot of commitment in our, in our team. You know, we've got some, some decent young players, and I think that uh, we're good enough to stay up. Whether we will or not is another matter. But do you feel that commitment was one major difference between the sides today, generally? Uh, oh, yeah, I think, that, I think possibly it was. You know, I mean, for me, Dave Watson at 21 is probably the best centre-half in the country. And I'm not saying that because I, I play for Norwich City, but I think that's fact. And he can't even get in the under-21 team. I find that very strange with the players that he's playing in the full international team. Probably that's a kiss of death for him, but never mind. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think that uh, his attitude throughout the season, since I've been there, anyway, since Christmas, has been absolutely magnificent. And he's a credit to, to any professional that I've, that I've seen. The one goal that uh, divided the teams was rather well laid on, I thought. Yeah, um, well, obviously, I was delighted, you know. I mean, I've laid on a few since I've been at Norwich, and uh, it just it just worked worked right for me. I mean, I had three players around me, and I tried to, tried to take it by them, but I haven't got that little bit of, as Laurie McManamy says, the old legs have gone a little bit. So I thought, well, Dave Bennett usually sneaks around the back, and he just nicked it far post, and, I mean, it was a tremendous ball. I'll give him a bit of credit. It was a, it was a good goal. A word about Chris Woods' save. Oh, great. I mean, for me, like, he's another very good player that... Uh, you know, though we've been, we've been struggling, we've only been getting points, we haven't been beaten for about four or five games, you know. And uh, the side's been playing well, but not, but, but not, but not winning. And uh, Woodsy's been playing his part, and the same as uh, m the majority of young players there. Horton. Trying to find an opening. Donaghy on. Moss! Oh, what a save! Brilliant save by Chris Woods from David Moss. Chris, I wonder how you would rate that save at the end from David Moss. Um, well, it was one really that I was just hoping that he wasn't going to blast it because if he was blasting it, I think probably it would have gone in. But um, I just stood up and waited to see what he was going to do and fortunately he put it within my reach. But he didn't exactly tap it though, did he? No, um, I can't, it all happened so quick. I can't really remember. I just remember just diving to my left and feeling the ball at my hand and hoping that somebody was going to kick it out afterwards. Was there much comment afterwards? Oh, they were quite pleased, you know.
it was uh, it's nice to do a save at that point of the match when like we we was winning one nil and the save that was you know it was important and um it books everybody up i think it might be seen in the long term to have been very very important yes um it'd be nice to if you did look back on it and think that um well that that save um saved us two points and hopefully keep us in the first division well, it could too, but with three points for a win, there are still 20 or more points to be won, and the battle for survival is really only just starting. And survival's a word that's on everyone's lips at the moment, and perhaps especially in the lower divisions. With most first division clubs suffering from a drop in attendances, clubs in division four find it even harder to attract paying customers. Down in the West Country, Torquay United tackled the problems in a unique way, as Alan Parry discovered when he went along to Torquay's home game against promotion contenders Port Vale. Colour and expectation here at the cottage, and even a boat race passing by a little later on. And we'll give you news of goals in all those games, and the rest, of course, as soon as we have them. At this point, though, we give you details of which match will supply our second-half commentary. Those details come... It's three o'clock on Saturday afternoon, and groundsman Fred King is the only man in sight at Torquay's Plainmore Stadium. There isn't a player or spectator to be seen at a time when the rest of the country is preparing for kickoff. Torquay slumbers while points are being won and lost. Years ago, Torquay decided to break with tradition by switching their home games to Saturday nights in a bid to attract more fans. The counter-attractions to fourth division football are many in a picturesque seaside resort where the sun always seems to shine. United don't have much competition from other football clubs. After all, the next stop from here is America but there's plenty for visitors to do and see in an area of natural beauty. For Torquay's footballers and their opponents, evening kickoffs mean a very different Saturday routine. At 10 a.m., the Torquay players, led by manager Bruce Rioch, take a bracing walk along the seafront. For Rioch, it's a very different setting to the industrial smoke of Derby, where he enjoyed the finest days of his own playing career. Torquay's moments of triumph are few and far between. They still talk of the day when the great Spurs team of the 60s came here for an FA Cup tie and attracted one of the biggest crowds in Torquay's history. Franco Farrell, who once led Leicester to a Wembley final, has long associations with Torquay, and Saturday evening kickoffs were his idea. I think evening games create a better atmosphere, especially when the terraces are not full. I always think there's a better atmosphere of football uh, under floodlight. And I think this is true of uh, all games on Saturday nights, that uh, there is a better atmosphere when we play. And I think the players like that. And uh, so that's an improvement in the afternoon. When you see empty terraces in an afternoon, the atmosphere isn't there for a good game of football. We really want to put on the matches when the public want to see football. Uh, and the important thing is there hasn't been much market research about kickoff times, and I believe there will be a lot more in the future. And you've got to remember that the traditional 3 p.m. kickoff does preclude all the people who play. And uh, in our area, there are a lot of chaps who will play in the afternoon and like to come watch us in the evening. But it does cause problems to visiting teams. Port Vale arrive at their Torquay Hotel at the time when on a normal Saturday they'd be running out for the second half. It's just before four o'clock and the Vale players have had a six-hour coach drive down from the Potteries. And now they've got an awkward couple of hours to kill before they get changed and set off for the match. And it's almost as bad at the homes of the Torquay players. Lynn Cooper, the wife of United's leading scorer Steve, would rather be doing the shopping. Instead, she has to watch the time. One, two, four o'clock. The paper call? Not yet, no. I can do anything for you. Find any shirts? Be white, then. Be white shirt. And that's all? Yeah. Okay, then. For Port Vale, one of the worst oh, aspects is finding out even before they've kicked a ball that most of their rivals for promotion from Division 4 have had a good day. Players are creatures of habit, and it all adds to the tension they already feel on a day when their routine has been completely turned around. 
and inevitably there's the reminder that they have still to play. Talking United against Port Vale is an evening kickoff at 7.30. The clock has ticked on to 6.30 and the Torquay faithful begin to arrive. Not exactly Saturday night fever, and after four successive defeats, Torquay hope their goalkeeper will prove as reliable as the pre-match entertainer. Well held, sir. His name's Mad Marcus, no relation to Bruce Grobelar, and one fan wasn't impressed as he settled down for the action. So Port Vale looking for an early goal here. Fox lucky to get the rebound and Newton in the clear and surely this could be the opener. No, a terrible miss really by Bob Newton. Key looking for some consolation in a half in which they've seen little of the ball. Half time approaching. And this is Alan Little looking to play the one two and gets it back. And Little with a fine effort just over. Brandon Little, the brother of the former Villa player, Brian Little, onto that one too. And he's dipping shot just over the bar. Port Vale, a stronger side, really built in the solid image of their own manager, John McGrath. And they contest every ball. Swung in by Colin Tart, the fullback. And it drops to Steele. And a fine point blank save. Steele onto it again. In the end, it comes to Armstrong, and another opportunity goes missing. Good build-up this by Port Vale, and Fox, who's been very much the man of the match, through again and finds Steele in the clear, and he gets a lucky rebound. Can he finish? Yes! Steele gets the goal. It will surely bring victory for Vale. The Vale fans delighted. And inevitably, it was Fox who set the goal up. But credit to Steele. He got a lucky rebound, but finished superbly to clinch three points. It will surely now make Port Vale manager John McGrath a little happier about playing on Saturday night. Oh, as long as we win. Don't mind. I don't like sat there, uh, sat there watching the results when the, the other teams are winning. Yeah, all your lads were a bit anxious, I think, when they saw that yeah. most of your rivals for promotion had won. Well, that's right, you know, but that's the way it goes. I mean, they'll be a little bit disappointed when they see the results themselves. So, it works both ways, but I'd have sooner played it in the afternoon. I suppose one of the problems about playing Saturday night, it doesn't give you much time for a celebration drink, does it? Well, we're not having one tonight, because we've got a game on Monday. We agreed to that. Well, the lads are not, put it that way. The players seem to disagree with that. Well, that's what I'll be on the fire escape. <laughs> well, news just in, and it's good news. Manchester United and England captain Brian Robson has this afternoon played his first game since seriously injuring his ankle back in February. Brian played for United Reserves in a friendly in Douglas Isle of Man, and he scored both goals with his head as United won 2-0. After a tentative start, Brian worked really hard, showed no sign of reaction to his injury, and now hopes to make his first team return at Old Trafford next Saturday against Southampton. That's one week before United's FA Cup semi-final against Arsenal. Incidentally, in that same friendly in the Isle of Man, Laurie Cunningham limped off at half-time. Still with United, Norman Whiteside misses tomorrow's league game at Sunderland. He sustained a hamstring strain during yesterday's 3-0 win against Coventry. And Lou McCary, who came on as sub and scored in that win, will be Whiteside's replacement. Well, young Norman Whiteside has often been described as the new George Best, but the old George continues to make news for the wrong reasons. Yesterday, over 7,000 Bournemouth fans turned up hoping to see George play his second game for the third division side, but he was elsewhere, and in fact hasn't been seen at Dean Court for a week. As no one seems to know of George's whereabouts, most people are jumping to the conclusion that he has again failed to fulfil promises made to Bournemouth. But manager Don Megson told me this afternoon, I hope to see George report for training next Wednesday and don't intend to lose much sleep over his whereabouts. Although he let us and the Bournemouth public down this weekend, I am prepared to accept at this moment that George's non-appearance is because he is so upset at the death of his former landlady, Mrs Fullaway, the lady who looked after him during his great years at United. The possibility that England could make a late bid to stage the 1986 World Cup finals has received a very cool reception from Harry Cavan. From his home in Ireland, the FIFA vice president told us, for a start, Article 39 clearly states that the World Cup cannot be staged twice in succession on the same continent. 
Secondly, Mexico, the only applicants FIFA are now turning to, might have economic problems, but they have the facilities and the World Cup generates its own revenue. Also, it would take an extraordinary Congress meeting of all 155 members to open the way for a European tournament, and even then, West Germany and Italy would be favourites, despite my own support for England. The reaction from FA Secretary Ted Croker this afternoon, I simply want to make FIFA aware that England are interested should an emergency arise. I am concerned that we are not represented on either FIFA's Executive Committee or the World Cup Organising Committee. Both Italy and West Germany are. Back to the Easter League programme and Ian Rush, who missed Liverpool's 1-0 win against Sunderland at Anfield yesterday, will be back for tomorrow's match at Manchester City. And manager Bob Paisley also confirmed that Liverpool still hope to sign Danish Footballer of the Year Michael Laudrup. The hold-up is over length of contract. Bob was far more guarded on the subject of Celtic's Charlie Nicholas, whose name has been linked with the English champions and Spurs. I know nothing about it, said Bob. But all the speculation about Charlie Nicholas has brought an angry response from Celtic manager Billy McNeil, who told us, We have received not one bid for Charlie. The ethics of English football are unbelievable. We hear that Liverpool had a queue, but we are aware of no queue. Charlie has been made a quite sensational offer to stay at Parkhead, we do not want to transfer him. Well, we stay with Scottish football now as we turn to more goal action and yesterday's match between Dundee United and Rangers, one which left United a point behind Celtic in the Premier Division. Your commentator, Archie McPherson. Away by McClellan, pressure still on. Oh, Bannon. Well, that's curled in very well, that's it. Ralph Milne, there was no cover there. one nothing. And United have got so many players forward to take that up. And as it came across, you can see that Milne was totally uncovered. And all he needed to do was just side foot it away. Dodds. Slack. Now Cooper. Better move by Cooper. Drifts away. Good ball to Clark. He's onside, good play by Clark, and it's in! He scored his first goal for Rangers. Busting away, it wasn't an easy ball to take. He was given a bit of clearance, but a delicate touch. Pushed it beyond the goalkeeper. Good running by Milne, can he get it? He does. Great play by Milne. Patterson, no oh, good journey. Yes, stood up, 2-1. That's Eamon Bannon, Patterson with him. There's the chip. Still in play, and that's a third one by Stark. Neatly taken, practically on the final whistle. A very, very neat goal indeed by United. Well, finally, the result of the March Goal of the Month competition with goals F, A, C and D e being your choices, all almost equally favoured in the voting. But the order chosen by our panel was F, E, C and the winning goal was the one that decided the Milk Cup final, scored by Ronnie Whelan for Liverpool against Manchester United. Here's Dalglish. Shot struck Makari. Kennedy. Whelan. And again, Wheelan's got it! Brilliant goal! Well, the first correct postcard pulled out of the bag was sent by young Graham Aldridge of Tonwell, Hertfordshire. Well done, Graham. £100 of the premium bonds are on their way to you. Well, that's it for today. I remember a splendid volley by a young man named Cannaville and a cannonball shot of another kind. If only we can begin to blend skill and fun again in football, perhaps the future will be that much brighter. Match of the day will be on its way to you again next Sunday at five past four with two First Division matches. And there's a full programme of league football around tomorrow and Tuesday. Let's hope the weather stays fine for the rest of your holiday. Happy Easter to you. <laughs>